Yes, sir, I am. Yes, sir, I am. A lot better. All right, guys, we'll get started this evening. Do we have any prayer requests tonight? <clears throat> any prayer requests? Continue praying for baby Ruth. Baby Ruth, right? Like the candy, right? Baby Ruth. <laughs> My uh, grandson, that's what they did. They re- his name Cesar, and they dre- dressed him like a Roman soldier, his first. Anyone else? Any, any prayer requests? Continue praying for Rusty and Brother Tim as well as he recuperates. He seems like he's recuperating fast. So thank God for that. Praise the Lord. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Continue praying for Armando's mom. Do you know her? I asked him, is Cynthia. The older lady? Is she at home? Does she wander? Not really. Just forgets. Okay. We'll be praying for her. I love her stories. I got them memorized. (laughs) Anyone else? All right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the blessings of this day, for all that you do in our lives. and Dear God, for your guidance and leadership in all things, dear Lord, and we do just continue to ask you, dear Lord, to, to lead us and guide us as you have until now. We do continue praying for the baby, dear Father, and we do thank you, Father, for uh, the good health that uh, Angelica has enjoyed, dear Lord. We do thank you for the good reports and praises we have heard as well, dear Father. Thank you for these successful surgeries and others have upcoming, dear Father. We think of... Uh, Rusty, and we do lift her up to you tonight, and uh, thank you for the recuperation that has occurred in some, dear Lord, that uh, how you've been working and how you've been blessing, and we thank you for these things, dear God. We thank you for graduations, and thank you for celebrations, and so many things that you're bringing into our lives, dear Lord. We thank you, we bless you for all these things, and for so many more, dear Lord, and Father, we thank you, and we thank you in the blessed and holy name of Jesus, amen, amen. All right. We you take your Bibles, turn to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Psalm 27. <clears throat> now, while you're turning there, um, I, I've had some things going on as far as uh, in my mind, my heart, some things God has put in, and some of them just did not make a lot of sense. And, but it was, it was order. The order was, was out. And so I want to share some of this with you. Uh, I, I talked about three different things, three different, and I'm going to give you a great example of this tonight. But three different, and this is a progressive thought. This is teaching and this is training on prayer. And I know prayer is prayer, but I, I just want to share something with you that I believe God has placed in my heart and uh, actually started putting it together. And it, didn't, it, it just didn't make sense, but the reason it didn't make sense to me, it was out of sequence. And I'll show you that tonight. Uh, once I got it back in sequence, or God basically revealed the right sequence, and you'll see this, it it all made sense to me. So let me go ahead and just cover a few things, then we'll get into a a lot of scriptures and a lot of things that we're going to be doing. Now, I'm not seeking to do this tonight and say, okay, here we are. It's something I want to stay at until we we get it, okay? So when I was a kid, when I was a kid, when I was your age, younger, um, Whenever a baby was born, you're having a child. Uh, there was no gender reveal. There was no, you're going to be in the back with the child. You sit over here and you wait until the child is born, and then they come out and get you. You guys remember, well, some of you guys don't remember that, but they would come get you. But now we, I mean, they didn't let us go back there. And they might let the mother but maybe not, but basically, okay, we're going to take care of business. 
and we would sit in something called a waiting room. And there you sat, the stork to deliver the baby. Or, and, and back then, people smoked. They smoked a lot. So, man, these rooms were, you couldn't see each other because everybody's nervous. And so all these guys, everybody's having babies. It, it's, you can't see, you can't, because everybody's smoking so bad, <coughs> which is so funny. So I want you to think about something with me, and I've brought a subject for you. I've actually got 12 subjects, but I want to stay at one, and I want to work the process through this with you. And uh, this is something that, like I said, it's not just tonight. I really would like to develop it into something because I believe it's, a, I, I just believe it's something very important. So let me go ahead and give you the sequence. Look, the verse. The sequence is this. I had it out of order. So let me get you the right order. First of all, there are times in our lives that we go to places that are unknown to us, undeveloped, or we've been there before, but not for very long. And so these places are unknown. I'll give you a great example in a second. Then what happens is, as I am in this place in my life, then there's a lot of things I don't know about God while I'm there. That while I'm there, God begins to reveal himself because God wants us to know him. That's, that's, that's something God wants, and I'll show you how that works as well. So the unknown place to me brings an unknown God because there's so many things I don't know about God. And shockingly enough, in churches, a lot of things that people believe are things that are repeated. In other words, the preacher of the preacher of the preacher believed that very few individuals are as noble as the Bereans, where they go and they seek for themselves and God speaks to them in their own heart. We're people of patterns and we're people of groups and we're people of followings. And a lot of times in church, I mean, there's some things you just can't question. When in reality, the best thing is to question everything. Because how would I know and how would God reveal anything to me if he wants me to know him? So there is an unknown place, there's an unknown God. But then it comes, and this is what I was telling you, the result in the end, not the beginning, is an unknown language. And I'm not talking about speaking in tongues as I was telling you. It's saying things that I never knew or never thought I could ever say. Uh, so let me go ahead and start with you. Psalms chapter 27. Psalms chapter 27. I want to begin with verse 13. The Bible says, I had fainted unless I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. First of all, I want to go to this unknown place. Let me, let me take you to an unknown place that many Christians have been at or are currently at. God will take you to a place you've never... So what place is that? It's the place where you have to wait on God. You ever been there? You know, there are times we ask God questions. There are three answers to us asking a question of God. Yes, no, and wait. And a lot of times we don't like the word no, and a lot of times we'll force something through, and then we credit it to God, and then when everything just falls apart... Well, where's God? Well, God never said yes. You said he said yes when actually it was no. But then there's times God says, wait. One of the hardest things in the world to do is to understand what it is to wait on the Lord. A lot of people think to wait on the Lord is to cross my hands and cross my arms, just say, well, I'm just going to wait on God and see what happens. That's not waiting on the Lord. And a lot of times we don't understand that there are times and seasons in our lives. Think of a few things. Children of Israel are in Egypt in bondage 400 years their instruction wait on the Lord how'd you like to wait on the Lord 400 years what about what about David wait on the Lord well from what from Saul chasing him how long did Saul chase him 15 years well what about let's say Joseph how long was he a slave in Egypt before he became what he became 13 you ever stop to think, if you look through the Bible, that a lot of individuals, a lot of situations that come into our lives are situations that require us to wait. Think about how many times we have been in the waiting room of God. It's unknown to me. I've never been in the waiting room of God. I've never been placed in a situation where God said, wait. And since I've never been there, a lot of times I wasn't there very long. And I jumped out of there and I went and did something. Let me, let, let me give you some examples of that. In life, in life, in your life, your experiences, and what you've seen in the world. What you've seen, not what I've seen. I've seen things, you've seen things. But let me bring out a few. 
How many times did we go and purchase something we didn't have the money for, but I wanted and I didn't understand weight? What was the consequence of that? How many times have individuals had a job that they just can't stand and they just can't wait for God to give them something else, so they quit and then they have no job? You ever heard of something like that where a person and then the older parents or grandparents says, you never leave a job unless you have another? Exactly. But how many times, because I didn't want to wait, because I couldn't stand the boss, I couldn't stand the atmosphere, I couldn't do this, and God said, wait right there. I don't want to wait right there. But yet it gets even more personal. How many individuals have engaged themselves, perhaps in a relationship where God said, wait, I have your Boaz. I have the individual for your life. And you jumped ahead and people lived their entire lives regretting they ever did that. You know what the answer God gave to those individuals? Wait. Wait. Wait on me. But since I've never been there and it's a place that is unknown to me, God becomes mysterious to me. God, what are you doing? If you're telling me to wait, then why? Why are you making me wait? And what are you making me wait for? And what are these things? And we go through this whole laundry list and it's nothing but questions. You know what that is? That is a God that is unknown to me because I neither know his character, I neither know what he's going to direct me to do, and I neither know the direction I'm going to take. And a lot of times I jump out of the place I've never been before when in all reality that's where God would have me to stay until he made himself known to me. That's what you see all over the Bible. You see individuals that were put in situations that were difficult. But yet while they were there, how in the world, listen, now I'm going to show you a passage in just a second. How in the world did Joseph go from, I can't believe my brother sold me. How did Joseph go from, I can't believe that they were trying to kill me. How did Joseph go from, where's my father, why is he looking for me? How did he go from that to 13 years later, what you meant for evil, God meant for good to save life. How did, he be, how did he become that? Because most of us, if we jump out of that waiting room where God would have us to wait, where God is molding us, where God is smelting us, where God is putting us together, forming us, he's the potter, we're the clay, and while he's working on us, and we jump out of it, and when we do, what would Joseph have looked like if he would have come out of God's waiting room? What would he, would have look, what would he look like to his brothers? Execute every one of them. Every one of them. I never forgot what you did to me. And the thing is, the reason he would respond in such a rabid, such a ravenous response would be, he never knew what God wanted him to become. And he never did what God would have him to do. Therefore, God never formed inside of him and God never directed him. And so Joseph would have just been an individual that would have grown what? Angrier. You ever see individuals that have grown angry in life? Individuals that have become negative in life? Individuals that have become all, let me tell you what happened. They left the place that was unknown to them because they didn't know why they were there. You are where you are today for a reason. And the sooner I realize the reason, and the sooner I realize the purpose, and the sooner I realize how I am to be there while I'm there, the sooner God will make himself known and you will see something about God that you never saw before. Joseph saw God telling him, I sent you here in order that all of your brothers and all of the legacy of your father might be saved. I sent you here for... Joseph went from, you guys sold me, you tried to kill me. He went from that to, God sent me here. What happened? How did he... And by the way, how did he keep that attitude and how did he keep and how did that love? Because he got to know the unknown God. The invisible God became visible to him. Same thing with David, same thing with Ruth, same thing with Esther, same thing with Moses and every biblical character that you can find. They all were put in situations. So I gotta ask you, how do you handle being in a place where God has told you to wait? I want you to wait. I, I want you to wait. But God, I want you to wait. So how do I do that? And how do I realize I 
am in a place that's God's waiting room. Well, the very first thing I want you to notice is a few things that are very, very odd. When you start looking at this passage and God has me in an unknown place, what's the first thing I got to ask him? Why? Why do you have me here? Why do you have me waiting? Why do you have me in this situation where things don't make sense to me? You may be in a situation like that, where you're just, I'm here, I know for sure God hasn't said yes or no to what I'm asking him. He's telling me to wait. Because everything about it is just, it's almost like a pause button. And it's almost like I want you to wait. And while he's telling me to wait, why? Why would you have me to wait? And God, what are you doing? Look at a passage very quickly with me. And by the way, this passage right here in Psalms 27.1, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I didn't want to wait to get to heaven to see what God wanted from me. I wanted to see him in the land of the living. I wanted to see God reveal himself. I want to show you a few passages very quickly. One is found in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, and you have to go in the back to find Habakkuk, you know. But Habakkuk, it's just before Zephaniah, chapter 1 and verse 2. Listen to this verse. This is a very short book. You get a chance to read it, then you read it. But Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2. Listen to what the prophet says. L listen to this. You talk about the waiting room of God. Look at this. O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou will not hear and even cry out in even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance for spoiling and violence are before me and there are that raise up strife and contention he's crying out to god and he's saying god do something I'm telling you the violence that's going on. I'm telling you the injustices that are going on. I'm telling you the unfairness that's going on. I'm telling you, God, that this just doesn't make sense. And he's crying out to God and he's saying, and you're doing nothing. You ever been there? You ever been there where you see something in your life? It might be an employer. It might be a job. It might be a relationship. It might be a friendship. It might be something that someone is going to, a son or a daughter or someone, and you're seeing them, and it's like, this just isn't fair. God, do something, and he does nothing. And here comes the word. You just wait. Now, I want you to go to the end of the book of Habakkuk. And notice what the Bible says in verse 18 and 19. This is the end of the book. How did the book begin? How did his letter begin? God, God how long will you allow this to happen? How long? I cried out in, of the violence and everything. You do nothing. Look at how he ends. Yea, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will join the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hind's feet, and he will make me to walk upon mine hind places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. How did he go from there to there? And how did he go from saying, God, where are you? What are you doing? Why don't you do something? And how did he go at the end and start saying, may the Lord be praised? Everybody, let's join in a chorus, and he begins to speak with joy unspeakable and full of glory. How in the world did that happen? You see, he was taken to the waiting room of God, which was unknown by his tone. Where are you? What are you doing? I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what you're doing. But through a, through a continuance of God doing some things, that's what we're going to talk about, the unknown God became known. And what happened is he burst out in praise. Have you always bursted out in praise when God said, wait? Have you always bursted out and said, you know what? Uh, what a beautiful thing just happened. There's some individuals that are so bitter and so angry, and they're bitter and angry still to this day because of something that happened. They went to a place they had never been before, and the unknown God remained unknown to them. And as long as he was unknown, then a very popular very common language came out of their mouth. Human anger, human bitterness. What happened with this guy? Look at the sequence. 
God put him in a place he'd never been before. And then as a result of that, and this is the process we're going to talk about, he put him in a place where God made and revealed himself what was the unknown tongue, even in the midst of continued violence and unfairness and all the above, you know, was uncommon. He started speaking praises unto God. Everything in his flesh and everything in his society, everything in his community wanted to blame God. That would be common. That would be common from our flesh. That would be common. That would be something that human beings do. But you see, what happens is God is speaking to your life, my life, his life, in what he's saying is don't wait to get to heaven to start speaking as if though you're already there. Don't wait to get to heaven to be thankful for all these things become thankful and all the above, but I have to go through these sequences to get to a place where instead of cursings, blessings are coming from my mouth. Instead of being a situation where I'm saying what's expected of me, I start saying something that literally defines speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because now I'm saying something that is aching and contrary to my flesh, but very familiar to the Spirit of God. How many individuals, listen, how many individuals, if they were to come home, men, women, children, and the tone and the words that were spoken, whereas before, let's say, I'm the father, and whereas before, I'm just cursing, I'm a drunk, and all the above, and then all of a sudden, I come, and all of a sudden, blessings are coming from my mouth, sweet words, and compliments, and strength, and encouragement. I mean, you'd look and say, that's not my father, that's somebody else. Well, what has happened is, I am now speaking in an unknown tongue because the unknown God has become known to me. And the Spirit of God is now speaking through me, and the Spirit of God has now revealed who and what God is to me. It's a sequence of events. So I want you to notice a few things here. I want you to notice a few things. And these things are so odd to me. They're so crazy that when I look at them, they're just... It's a sequence. So let's begin with this process. How did they do what they did? Is it something they only could do or is it something that's been written in order for our benefit that we might be able to learn from it? Because everything in the Bible says these things are written for our admonition. These things are written for our benefit. They're written to show us how common these individuals were, how common these men and women were, and to show how uncommon God was in their lives. What is it you see in the Bible? In the Bible, you keep seeing a succession of trouble, trial, and triumph, don't you? Isn't that the sequence of everything God does in the Bible? Here's individuals that are troubled. Here's individuals that are just basically going through tremendous trials. And then all of a sudden, you find the triumph in God, and you find these individuals doing things. Let me give you an example of something. This is so vast that I don't want to rush through it, because this literally shows a pattern of how to pray. And I'll give you a very practical, practical illustration with that. How in the world did these individuals, and you read them, pick up boxes, Fox's Book of Martyrs, pick up anything that has to do with the ages of the church and what the church has suffered. Pick up the book of Revelation where you find saints that were martyred crying out for justice, and he's saying, just wait, there's a few more. How did these individuals that were so treated and so horribly mistreated how did they speak in love, in kindness, in the gospel to the people that were putting them to death, and as a result, more got saved? That was, that was the Holy Spirit of God. And what was coming out of their mouth was unknown to them. What was coming out of their mouth is while they're blessing their persecutors and while they're blessing individuals that aren't doing, how different would life be if Christians, when they are placed in God's waiting room and God begins to reveal himself, we're going to see that, and then all of a sudden my speech changes. My speech changes toward my wife. My wife's speech changes towards me. My household speech changes to my children. It changes to my employers. It changes to all the above. Um, when, I look, when I was looking at the sequence of events, let me give you something practical. And the practical part is, is practical. So uh, I've, been, I've been helping, I've been working with this one company. And so the company I was working with, they asked me to do multiple things, multiple things. I mean, I, I, you ever seen Lucy when they have all the different hats that the mayor is putting on? Uh, that was me. 
you know, do this, do this, do this, do this. Go here, go there, go. And, and I did, and I was compliant. And so anyway, so the, 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 the company is going through all these changes and they've got, it's, it's a drop site. So their leadership is out of Fort Worth, it's out of San Angelo and all the above. Well, as it does, they're struggling financially. And while they're struggling financially, which we have nothing to do with, right? That's the company's problem. Um, I, did, I did chaplaincy. And so the chaplaincy I did, uh, I was asked to do, I'm going to be very detailed so you guys know this because all you guys work. You all know what work is like. So in work, you have what's called an offer letter, right? The offer letter says, this is what we're asking you to do, is how much we're going to pay you, and this is blah, blah, blah. Okay, you sign it, you give it back, right? And then HR holds on to it, puts it in their file, then you get reviewed in 30, 60, 90 days, right? That's common. So I get that. So I go and I start working for these people. So when I do they have a $10,000 clause added you know, to my salary after 90 days if I do this, this, and this. Three things. So I do two things, and then they promote me, but they give me another offer letter, and what was on the table is removed, so I go back to my base salary. Another 90 days. So the next 90 days, I'm asked to do something that's more responsibility, and keep doing chaplaincy, keep visiting people and keep doing this, working contracts, things like that. I do 90 days, and so then I speak to the owner, I don't speak to the owner, never spoke to me. I don't remember that conversation. Um, do you remember the letter with your signature? <laughs> and my evaluation, here it is, and my evaluation fits exactly what they were asking me to do. I don't recognize it. So, and by the way, now we want you to go back doing this so the 90 days begins again. So, you guys see what's going on, right? So, I never complained, never said a word. Everything inside me, everything inside me was bow up, right? I'm a bow up and I'm going to get the. But there's a problem because the company's ownership are Christians. They're faith-based. And so I have to deal with a brother. I'm not going to sit there and say, you're a brother, you're not a brother, you're this. Well, guess what? God placed me in a waiting room. God has placed me in a waiting room. And so I'm waiting, and I'm doing what I'm being asked. So then time goes on, and so the last, what was it, the last uh, Friday of the year, three of us, they let us go. Well, okay. No complaints, it's like, no call, no, just, just a text. I'm like, okay. Okay, that's fine. I mean, what do you do, right? Well, then after that happens, payday comes. My check gets deposited, and then it gets withdrawn. They take it back. Then I'm like, oh, it must be an error, right? A bank error or something like that. Monday comes around, well, did so-and-so call you? Nobody's called me. Uh, did you get an email? No email, nothing. So then I get an email. Well, you were doing two jobs. So we're going to pay you for one job, but the other job we paid you, we're going to keep the check and you owe us $1,400. So how would you like to have that the first of the month when mortgages are due and all the above and somebody just took your paycheck away that they owe you and by the way it's because you did a job and I got offer letters you did a job we're not gonna pay you for because we're only gonna pay you for one I never asked to do this job I I cut their costs doing it for them right so you can imagine right you can imagine I'm human but God's telling me to wait God's telling me to wait and while he's telling me to wait Instead of talking about it being unjust, unfair, and all the above, he starts taking me through characters of the Bible, and all of a sudden my mind changes, and it becomes, what are you trying to teach me? What is it you want from me? You have something for me. So I start listening to the Lord, I start talking to the Lord, and guess what, and I'm going to show you some passages in a second. All of a sudden, the unknown aspects of God become known. I don't belong to this world. I belong to another one. 
My citizenship is in heaven, not here. And everything in life is seeking. You know what God drew me to? We're doing work and there's people coming to the Lord. There's situations going, this is a distraction, son. Don't fall for the distraction. Stay focused. I am your trust. I have never let you down. And this is not the devil. This is not to just stay the course. Well, let me tell you what the end result was. So the end result is, man, God starts revealing himself to me. And I'll show you exactly how. So as God starts revealing himself to me, and he's got me waiting, because I, I've now got this accumulated debt I didn't have before, and all of a sudden these... So the guy that hired me, the guy that's a Christian, I wrote him a letter. I'll, I'll show, share it with you if you want to see it. Son. Thanking him for the job. And then speaking about how God has put in my heart to pray for him, for his family, and for his business. And then basically telling him, if you feel, his name, if you feel that this is the right thing to do, then I'll pay your money back and I'll do whatever you ask me to do because I believe you to be a good, honest, and fair man. And I believe you love the Lord. So I won't question you. I won't. If you say, I believe you need to pay this back, I'll pay it back. I won't say a word. I won't say a word negatively. I won't. You know what that is? That's an unknown tongue to me. Because you know what my tongue wants to do? My tongue wants to coil up and and my, my fingers want to start calling attorneys that I know and laborers and this and that. I just got ripped off. I have rights. And here comes God. No. You're going to bless him. You're not going to curse him. You're going to bless him. And so now all of a sudden, and as I start doing this, do you guys ever remember what it was like when, like your dad told you to do something, and you did it, and you did it excellently. You did something, he told you, cut the arm in, you cut it, and you did all, and then he comes, and he has this proud, and he's so proud of you, and he's hand around you and all, and it's like, you know, you're sweating there and all the above, but I did exactly, I didn't, you sure did. And boy, that was an outstanding, that's what it felt like. What it felt like was, it did exactly what I told you to do. The invisible God and the unknown God in the, in the zone of waiting and trusting, I know him more now. And what it does, it's created a calm over my life. And the calm that's come over my life, everything in me wants to respond and react. But he told me to wait. And after he told me to wait, he started walking me through a few things. And when he started walking me through a few things, it's pretty close to even touching and seeing him because he becomes that real. So I'm sending out my, my letter in the morning, and it's straight to him. I'm not publishing it. I'm not saying his name to you or anything. I'm just going to send it to him. And whatever he says, that's what I'm going to do. No complaints, no. And by the way, uh, I have accounts. I have accounts that I've worked. And these accounts, you know, it's, it's hospice. I work hospice. So these accounts and these that I did, well, there's patients I've been working with accounts. They belong to them. In other words, uh, if people come and they need that service, instead of me taking them and saying, well, I'm just going to go ahead and do it over here, do this or while I was working, I worked under them, so therefore these things belong to them. And the book of business belongs to them. So I'm shipping all that to them, and I'm not going anywhere near these accounts. You see, at the end of the day, it's not what man deems me to be. It's what God has instructed me to be and do. And guess what that does to me in my own life, in my own home, my own wife, my own children? Well, my response to them is different. Folks that I know in church and all the above... It changes who and what I am because the known God is making himself known to me. And while he's making himself known to me, I'm saying things that in my flesh I shouldn't be saying. I'm saying things that humanly speaking, I say this to people that are not in church, even in church, you're like, you're nuts. You ought to be fighting for everything you ought. You know, dial 44444. <laughs> Get him. I can't. I won't. And so that tongue doesn't belong 
in this setting because it's coming from the Lord and it's the Lord that's guiding. I want you to see something with me. Look at 2 Peter. Look at 2 Peter and begin reading with me, if you would, 1 Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. And I want you to see something with me that is just beyond incredible. The Bible says in verse 2, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So one of the things God wants you to see is I want you to notice, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. Grace and peace and the knowledge that it comes through the knowledge of God. The more you know God, the more his peace will be multiplied in your life. And the things in this world that are seeking to draw you away and take you somewhere you shouldn't go, you don't want to go. It's the grace and peace of God that keeps you there. How do I get to the grace and peace of God? It's through the knowledge of God and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, how do I know the knowledge? How do I know about God? Well, first of all, if you're a Christian, the Spirit of God dwells inside you, and the Spirit of God, what he does is he enlightens his word to you. And when he enlightens his word to you, God begins to instruct you. The instruction you receive of the, of the Bible is not the instruction you're going to receive from the world. They're contrary to each other. And so therefore, when you get into the word of God and you start trusting, believing, I'm waiting. But while I'm waiting, the very first thing is God begins to answer the why. God begins to answer the what. God begins to reveal the when. And when I do those things, all of a sudden I find myself in a situation where I get to know God. Now, look at the following portion of scripture. The Bible says <clears throat> in verse 3, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. There's, there's that word knowledge, through the knowledge of him. You won't access any of these things. You won't get any of these things. You won't experience or encounter any of these things that are following unless you have a knowledge of him. It doesn't mean you have to Spurgeon said the more I get to know God the more I realize how little I know about God but it talks about the more I get to know him the more I get to know and God wants you to know him and he's gonna you're gonna know him by the places that he puts you in if the place he's placed you in is a place of waiting it's not the waiting that is killing you it's not it's the indirect communication with God for if you had that the waiting room of God becomes a very comfortable place. I want you to read the following portion. Look at this, same passage. The Bible says in verse 4, watch this. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might become, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Well, there's that heavenly insight, isn't it? where you start having a nature that's not your own. In other words, I have a flesh nature. I have a sinful nature. But what happens is the more I get to know God and the closer I get to know God, the longer I long to be with God. What begins to happen is the divine nature of God begins to activate itself in my life. So the life that I now live, I don't live it unto myself anymore. I'm living it unto God. Now watch this. Look at this. It says, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises. So this waiting room that I'm in is full of promises. And where am I going to find the promises of God? Right here. So when I start looking to God, because what happens is if I'm in the waiting room of God and I'm just seeing the obstacles, I'm just seeing what's objected, what's away from me, the things that are attacking me, and I never get to the promises of God, all I hear are the accusations of the world. And if I hear the accusations and the threats and all of the things that the world is lancing at me, well, guess what? I'll never see God or encounter God or experience God at all. I'll only get angrier. And so he is saying that in the midst of being where God would have me to be, this unknown place, to me, this unknown place or very, uh, a, a place that I, I frequent or whatever it may be, but I'm in a place of waiting. I'm in the waiting room of God. He has me waiting. 
Then all of a sudden he says, let me go ahead and start going over these precious promises. I have precious promises that I've given unto you. So what's, what's the first thing that occurs when someone makes a promise? Like, like if, if, if you make a promise, if you make a promise, if you make a promise to cash, and you tell cash, this is, we're going to go fishing Saturday, whatever. Guess what he's expecting to do on Saturday? You know why he does? Because mama don't lie to him. And if I can't do it for you, we're not going to do it. But when we can, if we're going to go get a pair of boots, we're going to go do whatever we're going to do, we'll do it on this day. Well, what, is he, what is he basing and what do we base promises on? We base them on who's promising it. So the first thing God does in getting to know him is we find out that he is incapable of lying to us. In the waiting room, God begins to reveal to us, I will never lie to you. I'm not lying to you. I haven't lied to you in the past. I'm not lying. I'll never lie to you. And so guess what begins to happen in that waiting room? The unknown God, I now know he will never lie to me. And he starts making promises to me. But you see, these promises are there and these promises are there and they're conditional upon what? Waiting. Which is now enacting my what? My trust. My trust in God. And so I now have promises. Now look at this. Great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now watch this. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. To virtue, there it comes again, knowledge. To knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. To brotherly kindness, charity or love. For if these things be in you, listen, what did he say? I'm going to give you some precious promises. And these precious promises will enact my divine nature in you. You'll start, be, you'll start beginning to act, look, and behave like you belong to me. You'll now begin to see the very image of God in you. I'll show you that in a second. So notice what it says. It says, for if these things, there's the conditional clause. If these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is the unknown God becoming known. There are people right now that sit there and how in the world am I going to get out of this situation? God, what? I don't know him. But yet everything you just read right now says God has given great and precious promises to you. They belong to you. And these will enact his divine nature so that individuals will say, listen, there's something different about that man. There's something different about that woman. There's something different about that person. Why? Because if I was them, I would have done. And yet, it's the contrary. And I'm seeing something I've never seen before. Well, guess what God's doing? God is receiving, God is revealing himself, but God is getting glory from what we're doing and praise. But then, here it comes. He's drawing the world to himself through your trial. And so individuals are now beholding your behavior. They're seeing how you're acting, and it's nothing they've ever seen before. So guess what? They no longer see you. They're starting to see who is at work in your life. I don't know about you, but there are times I, I love to do this. I'm not a country boy. I'm a city boy from the barrio, but I always wished I was a country boy, but I'm not. I'm not a cowboy. Sorry, I have a pair of boots, but they were given to me, and I mean, good. But I got to tell you something I do love. I love to walk in an open field with a full, beautiful moon. That just, that, that just turns my light on. I mean, I just, I'm out there singing, I'm out there dancing. I'm, I love a full moon. You know, it's so odd that I can't see like it's the sun, but I can see a lot of things with a clear moon. There's a lot of things you can see. You know, it's the only odd thing about that. The moon has no light of its own. You know what you're seeing? The moon is in an orbit where it is reflecting totally from the sun. 
You know what happens to your life whenever it is people start seeing something different in you? It's not your energy, it's not your light, it's not your godliness, it's God reflecting him off of you. You're just in the right orbit. You're just in the right place so that now the reflection of God is now seen by those that are watching. And guess what people do? They start getting attracted and drawn to the Lord. People used to call that relationship evangelism. People used to call it this. You know what it really is? It's just being a Christian in a lost and dying world. It's been said by an old priest, preach the gospel at all times and use words when necessary. There should be something about the way that we live that should be drawing people to Christ. There should be something about our behavior. There should be something about the way we speak, the way we act, the way we respond. There should be something where there's a waiting, watching world that they're looking, they're saying, there is something different. And the thing that is different is not us. It is that we, through the knowledge of Christ and through being fruitful, we begin to reflect him to a waiting, waiting and watching world. Did you notice that the Bible says, if you notice all of these things, it says, for if these things be in you. Now, which one of these things are impossible? Uh, is it impossible? Look at this. That, that is an, uh, let me go ahead and dispel that myth. Don't ever ask God for patience. That's, that's not biblical. That's, that thought isn't even biblical. You know where patience comes from? Patience comes from being in this world and living and following the process. There's nobody here asking for patience, but I got to tell you something. Have you grown patient carrying that baby for nine months? Ladies, when you, did you learn some patience and stuff? You didn't ask for that, but you just did. Or perhaps in life, some of the things that you've been through, if you've ever done farming or anything like that, anything that you had to wait on, what happened as a result of no, what happens is patience has already been given to you. The problem is you'd rather speak your mind than take what God has taught you and reflect it. That is now me wanting to be me. Now look at it again. Does, you're not going to find anywhere in the Bible where it says, ask for patience. I'll show you a bunch of passages that say, this leads to this, to this, to this. Let me show it to you. Notice what the Bible says. Remember, we're looking for knowledge, right? Look at this. It says, and be, verse 5, and beside this, giving all diligence to your faith, virtue. In other words, when you're doing this and it's virtuous, you're doing it in such a way that you're not drawing any attention to yourself. You're trusting God. You're believing God because it is God and it's virtuous, right? To your faith, uh, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge. In other words, the more that I read, the more that I study, the more that I seek God, the more that I search God, because my faith is being acted upon and I'm acting in faith and I'm doing it to not draw any attention to myself, when I go to the Word of God, guess what? I'm a clean slate and the Word of God begins to speak to me. One of the reasons that the Word of God doesn't speak to individuals is because I come to it with anything but a clean slate. I already have other things on my mind. I already have other things that are overpowering me. There's a sequence here. I am to act upon my faith. I am to enact my faith. I am to do things by faith. And when I start doing things by faith, I do them in a virtuous manner. Now, when that happens, you know what's the strangest thing? It wipes the slate clean in my heart and my mind. So when I go to the word of God, I get what? A fresh word from God. Now, watch this. It says, and to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. Notice where patience is nestled between temperance and godliness. How I respond and my temperance is how I endure. We've endured stuff, haven't we? If you've ever had medical situations, you've endured. If you've ever had financial and you went through it, you endured. The question is, if I did it, and then as a result of it, I begin to reflect the Lord, guess what? Patience has now been enacted into my life. I got to tell you something. I have, uh, uh, without, I have every reason to be locked up in a rubber room. Seriously. <laughs> I have every reason in the world to be the angriest thing that ever walked the face of the earth. 
through my upbringing, through my early years, through experiences in church, I should be the angriest thing that ever walked the face of the earth. How can I, with everything I've been through, God has never left me, and God has never forsaken me. And so as a result of all that, guess what? When things come into my life, it's like, oh, I've seen you before. Another trial comes, oh, I've seen you before. I know what's happening. I know this is bringing this. I know it's bringing that. And so now all of a sudden, where I used to just respond in certain ways, patience has overwhelmed me. It, I've told you this before. I remember when I, was, when, uh, when I was a young man, I lived in Austin, Texas, and my, my, uh, my boy, he was a little baby. He was a year, a little over a year. And, uh, you know, we're driving to downtown, and I have to get there. It's 8 o'clock, Austin. And, and I have a, I have a, a, a 1979 Monte Carlo two-door. And that thing is running on four cylinders, and it's a six-cylinder. It's sputtering, it's doing all that. I don't have any family, I don't have any. I was so nervous, I was so scared, I was so anxious that when I had my foot on the brake because of all the traffic, I have a little boy in the back, he's wet, he's crying. My foot is shaking from how nervous I am because I don't know what to do I'm 22 years old I'm a kid I go to Dallas Texas I'm going to school I go and drop the kids off I'm on my way I'm in Dallas going downtown all of a sudden my Oldsmobile Robert it dies it just dies on me I throw that puppy into neutral I coast off and I just park I call Toby, a kid, and I said, hey, can you bring me a 916 wrench? Bring me this. I tell him to bring me these things, and I'm like, and I go into a place called JoJo's. He comes, and what happened? I said, my fuel pump went out. And he says, what are you doing? I said, oh, I'm eating breakfast. What else do you want me to do? And so remember the old fuel pumps on the side, and it had a little spring on it? So you just took the two bolts off, you take it off, you put it back on, and then you just pump it a little bit, and I'm off to school. What was the difference? Why did I respond that way here? Over here, I was inexperienced. Over here, I was a kid. Over here, I'd never been through it. And all my, how am I going to pay for this? I don't have any family. You know, what am I going to do? And, you know, over here, it's a stupid fuel pump. Se cambia. All I have to do is change it. And if it doesn't work, hey, I get a day off. If I am over here, and I'm still responding like I did over here, something is horribly wrong. If I'm responding now, the same way I responded when I was a teenager, 20, 21, 22, I'm now 62 years old, and if at 62, I'm still anxious beyond belief, and I'm still, my legs are still trembling, I'm doing all that, something's wrong. Because experience should have already developed what? Patience been through this before I, I can imagine I can imagine you know some of the things that we've been through in life right and some of the things that we've seen and over here we had every excuse to do all this why it's almost like this if you're one of five children the worst child to be is the fifth one you're never going to get nothing new <laughs> And you have to be within an inch of your life before they pay attention to. Now, when you're the first child, <coughs> to the emergency room. A little scratch, he's dying. The fifth child, boy, the eyes already popped out, the ears cut, and all of a sudden, just slap a Band-Aid on him. He'll be fine in the morning. Why is it that parents respond to the fifth child differently than they do to the first? It's called experience. Experience. And what has experience taught you? Why am I going to fly off when I've already seen this before? You know what that is? Patience. Endurance. You've been here before. Well, in Christianity, if you add to that the knowledge of God, not only do I now have experience and patience, I now know why He's doing it. I have knowledge. And if I have knowledge, I know what God is doing. I know what God is up to. You know what it creates? Instead of anxiety, it creates excitement. Because, listen, 
I don't know how he's going to get me out of this. I don't know how he's going to do this. I don't know how. I just know he is. <laughs> I just know he's going to do. So my, my transmission on, uh, I drove, I have a 98 Ford Ranger. You see my little Ranger. And I was going back and forth and, you know, I'm courting a little blonde-haired, green-eyed girl and I'm going back and forth. To, I'm driving 1,000 miles a week just to go back and forth. So don't you dare question it's not love, suegra. <laughs> and so back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. That thing never, Brother Robert, 98 Ford, oh, Ford never broke down on me. I mean, that's like parting the Red Sea. <laughs> that's, like, that's how miraculous that is. It wasn't a Toyota or a Honda. It was a Ford. Well, I'm driving it. I go. Right when all this happens that I'm telling you, and I'm going to the bank to find out what happened, and they tell me, can't help you. I got, you know, $2.30 in my bank account, and I go back, and I'm like, well, I guess I'll figure this out. I get in my truck. Nothing. I just call Shannon, come pick me up. I left it there till the next day. I had no idea what I'm going to do. I have no idea what I'm going to do. And so it's this, it's that. Robbie, who's preached, Mike calls him, he calls me, he says, I got a wrecker on the way, we're going to go pick it up. I got a friend of mine. Okay. Where are you going to take it to? Mike calls me, let's take it to Joe, our mechanic. So Joe t gets the vehicle, Mike calls him, and I'm like, Mike, I wish you would have brought it here. Well, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to tell him, I can't fix it because I don't have any money. How am I, I'm going to have this guy fix a transmission, a clutch, a flywheel, and, you know, I'm not going to pay him on good looks, good, good grief. I'm bankrupt if that's the case. I already took care of it. You need your truck. You know, I didn't know how he was going to do it. I just knew he was. I told you this Sunday, Robbie is a disciple of mine. Mike as well. I've poured my life. I love these men. They love me. They didn't ask me, can I help you? They just did it. You know why? Because I would do the same for them. That's, everybody here has people like that, don't you? Everybody here has people just like that. Who put those people in your life? God did. So guess what happens when God places me in his waiting room and I'm waiting on God and it's like, I don't know what. You're going to reveal yourself to me, aren't you? You're going to make yourself known to me. So while I'm sitting here waiting, let me do a few things and I'm going to stop because I'll pick it up. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage myself in the Lord as David did. The second thing I'm going to do is to serve or to wait. I'll just put a un delantar, ¿cómo se dice an apron. More tea, man. More fries, sir. More bread, man. To wait on God does not mean sit and cross my hands. It means to wait on God and keep serving God and keep serving God in the capacity that he's given unto me. So instead of sitting there saying, oh, woe is me, put the apron around and start serving tables. And the sooner I start serving tables and the sooner that I start encouraging myself, here comes God. And here comes the whisper. Here comes Psalm 46, 10. Be still. Oh, oh it's going to get good now. Somebody bring out popcorn. Why? He just told me to be still. I know what follows. What follows? And know that I am the Lord. Be still. I'm right here. Okay, mijito. I'm right here. I'm going to make myself known in you. Just be still. Don't move. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, with the right hand of my righteousness. You just be still. So now all of a sudden, the apron goes down, all of the above, and it's like, what would you have me to do? Well, now Romans chapter 8 starts working in my life, and what begins to happen is I begin to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. So when I begin to pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, what begins to happen is I begin to speak to God His will. 
How do I know God's will? For he searches the hearts of men. For the Spirit of God knows what the will of the Father is. And so therefore, that same person, that same individual that dwells in me, that's been revealing God to me, his character, everything about him, that same individual, now, be still. Be still. And he begins to instruct me on how to approach God, how to speak. And now all of a sudden, out of my mouth, rather than cursings, there's blessings. Rather than accusations, there are praises. Rather than being downtrodden, there is rejoicing. And so what begins to happen is joy unspeakable and full of glory. So guess what has just occurred? The sequence of the place I did not know and the God that I did not know while I'm in this place has now made himself known. And out of my mouth and out of my person, he begins to reflect Jesus off of me. And now all of a sudden, he fills me afresh and new. By the way, people hear the words, be filled with the Spirit of God, and so many Baptists for you, oh my God, that means, that means you're going to start, no, no, let me tell you what being filled with the Spirit of God is. Being filled with the Spirit of God is yielding and surrendering yourself to him, and literally what begins to happen is you begin to do exactly as he instructed in the book of Acts, you're going to see this. Look, look for it. And being filled with the Spirit of God, they spoke the name of Jesus boldly. That's, that's what you'll find. Every time. It doesn't say they went and started running. They started screaming. They start, it doesn't say anything. It says, and being filled. Look for it in the book of Acts. And being filled with the Spirit of God, they spoke the name of Jesus boldly. Guess what begins to happen? Now all of a sudden, the most important thing for me in my life. Now that I, God has made himself known to me, I now want to make God known unto you. To know him and to make him known. Now all of a sudden, the work of the evangelist begins to find its root in my life. Now all of a sudden, sharing Jesus without fear begins to find its root in my life. Now all of a sudden, I'm over here so concerned about the souls of men and women, boys and girls. I'm no longer in a waiting place. I'm no longer in an unknown place for an unknown God. Now for the first time, perhaps in my life, now I know what he wants from me. And he has equipped me to do it in such a way that it brings him glory. And so I walk through these. So what I'm going to do, the follow, this, this, is, this, is, this is where I'm taking you. So through a succession of days, there's some little paragraphs I'm going to give you. And in these paragraphs, all it is is read them. They're, they're little daily, and this is what I'm ask, going to ask you to do. I'll instruct you. I'll walk you through it. This is just an introduction. It's to write down that day what God revealed to you. What God is requesting of you, what you're struggling, that belongs to you. But let me tell you, by the time you get over here, you will see the handiwork of God. And you will see the fingerprints of God. Knowing God is not for lazy people. And knowing God comes at a price, and it comes in a discipline. And when I discipline myself to do these things, it's no longer about church, it's about Christ. It's about what God would have me to do. And the things that I formerly did not know about God, now all of a sudden, not only do I know them, not only are these things uh, a blessing to me, I now am in a place that I can literally understand what God wants from me. Uh, by the way, let me read this to you. It's first, first Peter, and I close with this. Remember how we started all this, and it's usually in, in the guise of trials? First Peter 1 Peter 1.7 says, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love, in whom though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls.
we'll pick up from there. And we're going to be in the book of Philippians. I'm going to take you to some places. I'm going to walk you through this process, and we're going to walk through the process of being in God's waiting room. Then from that, it should affect the way I pray. So I'm going to walk you through this so that it's between you and God, me and God, us and God, but how we begin to pray. Then from that, we'll move on to something else. You know what the strange thing is? I told Shannon this. I've been working on this for a long time. It's just the sequence was wrong. The sequence is right. I got it in my head. But let me tell you what's so funny. Let me tell you what God whispered in my heart. The whole theme for this year is faith. Just shall live by faith and by faith, dot, dot, dot. Well, son, the only way, well, back up and you'll love this. Anybody know, ever heard the singer Leanne, Leanne Ryan? I, I, they used to call her the new Patsy Cline. That girl can sing, okay? When she first came out singing, George Strait went to hear her. And George Strait, lit, and they said, what do you think? And he said, this is what he said. Boy, she's something, but she'll really be something when she starts singing from a broken heart. Because you can't sing a country song without a broken heart. That insulted her. Leanne Ryan did not like that because her voice, her vocals, her pitch, everything was perfect. And George is like, no, no, no. Her, song, her, her voice is perfect. There's nothing. But when she starts singing with a broken heart, boy, that's going to be something. Well, she went through some stuff in her life, and she's like in her early 20s. She looks up old George and says, I now know what you meant. I know exactly what you mean now. Well, listen. By the same token, God started, and I told Shannon this, I pulled her aside and I said, you know, God has put this in my mind. I've been working on it. And here comes God saying, well, I can't, I can't rightly have you teach something I don't walk you through first. And I'm like, God, can I just go ahead and teach on blessings? <laughs> Receiving? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. I'm going to walk you through this. But before you have the right to say it, let me walk you through it. Did I tell you that? And then all of a sudden, everything begins to happen. That wasn't the devil, folks. That was God. But in the midst of all of that, boy, we've had a time. Last night I told Shannon, uh, you know, uh, some stuff happened, good things. And I'm like, okay, let's go celebrate. Listen, if you're going to celebrate, and you're going to celebrate in a godly manner, and, and it's going to bring heaven down, you go either to Marble Slab or you go to Baskin Robbins, okay? I mean, you go get yourself a nice Sunday of that, and she loves extra hot fudge, and I love... If you're going to go celebrate, if you're going to do it, go do it right. And if you're going to do it right, you find yourself big old cone and all of the above. I wish I could tell you oh, I'm so fearful of what's coming next excited, excited, because he's only making himself known. Have I ever lied to you? You never lied to me, sir. Have I ever left you or forsaken you? Never have. Have I ever given you a promise that I did not fulfill? Never. When everybody left and everybody forsook and you were by yourself, did I ever leave you? No, you didn't. Has anybody ever loved you more than me? So then the famous line of heaven. Put your hands in the bucket, put your seatbelt on, enjoy the ride. When you get to the top, smile because you're probably going to have your picture taken. Enjoy your, enjoy your day at Six Flags, Fiesta, Texas. Always wanted to say that. <laughs> enjoy it. Yeah, there's going to be some times that it'll go down fast and come up and it'll be a but enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. I'll get you where you need to get to. Father, we thank you for all that you do in our lives and the blessings which are many. And so lead us, guide us, dear God, and Father, help us to know where we are in our lives today. And if we find ourselves in a situation where we are literally in a place I've, I just haven't been before, or a place that I've been, but I've never liked it, Father, help me to see the beauty of where you place me. And then, dear God, in the instances that I have not seen, known, experienced, or encountered you, 
Father, let me place myself in the right mind, the right heart, and the right spirit. The knowledge of God regarding where I am in life would come to me. That you would reveal yourself to me. That I, with, with great confidence, would say, I know in whom I have believed. And I know that he's able to keep that which he's committed unto me until this day. I know that. Help me to be with an understanding as, as Paul had. Help me to be with an understanding as other individuals had. And help me, dear God, get to a place where I not only know you, but I know that you're going to receive glory as a result of it. And Father, what that should do in my life is fill me with joy unspeakable and full of glory so that when I do, I praise you. When I do, dear God, I lift up my voice to you so that when I do, dear God, the concern for the lost and the concern for those that are in need of a Savior begins to take precedent over everything else. Help me to understand, dear God, and help me to live in such a way that you are well-pleased, that you're well-pleased with the life that you've given me. You've given me this life. The only reason I'm alive today is because you granted me mercy. And you, dear God, have been faithful. And so, dear God, help me to live in such a way that you are so blessed and pleased and that, Father, I understand. I understand and I receive the God who has saved me. Use my life. It belongs to you. Lead me and guide me, dear God. Don't let me be the same that I used to be. Don't let me be the same person. But change me. Transform me. Let the metamorphosis of the Spirit of God continue to work in my life so that the old man, dear Father, is not even recognizable anymore. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. We bless you, dear God, and for all the prayer requests and praises that we have, dear Lord, and many that are unspoken, we lift them up to you. Thank you, dear God. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. We bless you, we praise you, and we thank you for all these things and so many more. And dear God, we thank you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you.